everyone. Welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. My name is Jane Applegath, a former award-winning stockbroker, television producer, yoga instructor, serial entrepreneur, and now founder of the Epic Vision Zone. Each show, we offer you an inspiring person or message to bring you closer to your big dream by showing you how to enter the portal to possibilities, prosperity, and potential so that you can live your epic life. Thank you so much for being here today. Famous author Stephen King wrote, the scariest moment is always just before you start. Lynette Pottle is on a mission to help women channel their unique wisdom into compelling books that captivate readers, showcase their expertise, and create lasting impact. A business strategist turned transformation book coach and publishing mentor, Lynette is a multi-book Amazon international best-selling author, the founder of Positivity Lady Press, and the driving force behind the international best-selling Light Beamers book series. Her extensive book writing knowledge and expertise have led her to work with renowned media outlets such as Hay House Radio, Authority Magazine, Next Advisor, and much, much more. With guest appearances on numerous podcasts, a TEDx talk, and even sharing the stage with New York Times bestselling author, Jack Canfield, she continues to grow her influence to inspire others. A steadfast advocate for women, Lynette is dedicated to helping women amplify their voices so that they can spur positive change and make a difference in the world. Her energetic and inspiring process has made her a trusted guide for women authors, encouraging them to shine through her She Gets It published brand, including the podcast she hosts by the same name. Welcome, Lynette. I am so excited to have you here today. Jane, I am thrilled to be here. So good to spend time with you. Well, writing a book, let's delve into this journey. First and foremost, I would... I would love, and I'm sure our audience would love to know what inspired you to do the work that you do today. Well, it's really interesting because it's a place where I never, ever thought I would be first and foremost, <laughs> right? I think we all have journeys and it's not always a straight line. That's certainly been the case for me. But the reason I'm doing the work that I'm doing today is to inspire and empower other women knowing for me, it took me seven years and 56 days to publish my first book. And the reason why is total garbage. <laughs> it was because I was arguing my limitations, telling myself a story about mm. all the reasons why I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the resources. I didn't know the people. And it really was all a big story. And I know that I'm not alone in that. There are so many women out there that have so much wisdom to share that can shape and influence our world that that's my driving force behind doing this work. Prior to this, I was a, a life and business strategist. And so the clients that I work with really are the same. Primarily, I work with women coaches and entrepreneurs. And what I found was that the book is a part of the business strategy, but also our conversation started moving more and more towards how, how did you write your book? How did you publish your book? And all of these types of questions that, so it was a pivot in my business, but it was just a natural kind of evolution is more what I think about it like. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that because you were sharing a transformation with women in your coaching. Yes. And through that transformation, we express ourselves and what better way to do it than through a book. You know, it's uh, the it's the daunting task of the book. Like you said, you were arguing with your limiting beliefs. I love that. <laughs> but at least you were <laughs> arguing. Mind you, it took you quite some time. So I, 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 I admire you for admitting that it took you so long to write that first book. And obviously, you're here to help women move that much along much faster than it needs to be. So just give us a little insight into what really helped um, when you were struggling to write your first book. Yes. And with me, it wasn't as much about the writing process. I had my first book was about I had written an article and in, in my local newspaper I had a weekly column, which was around 
elevating positivity and how you could change your world through positivity, small acts of kindness. And so that whole year, I had all of this content together that I wanted to turn into a book, but I didn't have any idea how to do it. This was 2011, and self-publishing certainly wasn't as prevalent and as easily accessible as it is today. But like I said, my beliefs around, I didn't know anyone that had published a book at that time. I live in a very small community in rural Maine, and so you know, how the heck would I do that? And I just moved on from the idea. And then if you fast forward to 2018, I was participating in a mastermind group. And one of the women in the group was talking about wanting to publish her book. And the leader of the group had said to her, you can publish your book in 30 days. And being the cheerleader that I am, I'm like, yes, you can do this, like spurring her on. And then the conversation turned like in an instant. And my mentor, Jamia, she turned to me and she said, and Lynette, you can too. Well, let me tell you, in that moment, I, I felt like a duck paddling. <laughs> like my little feet were just paddling underneath the water. I was looking calm, cool, and collected on the surface, but I really shut down from the conversation. And I went into this internal dialogue about who, who were you to say this to me? You don't know what I have going on in my life. And again, back to that arguing my limitations. I was an expert at that before I was an expert at anything else, I think. But so we got off the call and that night, I just couldn't get the conversation out of my mind. And I woke up the next morning and I thought, okay, maybe it won't be the book that you were thinking that you would write someday. Maybe it's about using something that you already have. And I went back, flashed back to this idea of this newspaper article, the articles that I had written. And so with Jamia's help, having a mentor, to your direct question, having a mentor to help guide me and encourage me and push me, quite frankly, um, to see more possibilities, she introduced me to the world of indie publishing. And what happened after that is, you know, once the blinders are off and you start to see possibility, you find solutions all around you. And that's exactly what happened for me. You know, I had been telling myself this story about I... I didn't know people that did things like this and I wouldn't be able to find an editor or do these things. Well, as it turned out here in my little rural community in Maine, I found a world-class editor. She had worked for some of the top five publishing houses and um, an amazing woman. And I partnered with her. And so she became my editor, the person that did my layout and design work also was from my area. She had been living in Nepal and had recently moved back to my little uh, small town main area. And I hired her to work with that. So I had this professional team to work with that was literally in my backyard that I, because I wasn't seeing possibility, I didn't even know they were there. But once I had Jamia, my mentor had mentioned, well, hey, you can do this. And here, let me show you how to do this. Um, everything just unfolded. And I think that's the key. A lot of times we just need someone to help us see our blind spots. That was certainly the case for me. And it is with many of my clients. Mm, that is so rich. Yes. She basically, the mentorship pushed the door open for you so that you could see the possibilities. And by opening that door, what it did is it made you accepting of the help that was around you when all all along you were saying in your mind there's nobody in this little town that's gonna be able to help <laughs> me how could that possibly be and they were right at your doorstep but it, it required that opening and for her to open that your pod the possibilities for you to change your mindset in other words yes. so that you could yes. be the receiver instead of the pusher oh my gosh oh my that gosh is, yeah <laughs> That's true, right? You were the you became the receiver instead of the pusher. So and in, that's in one huge. You're on the one side of the door. No, no, no. And then the other, it's like, oh yes, come right in. I invite you in. Oh my gosh, that's a beautiful story. <laughs> and the other, 
the other part of that, like you said, being the person pushing, well, yes, I was kind of pushing the door and arguing my limitations, but also I was the person in this life and business strategy world in my coaching, I was being the support for other people. I was being the mentor for other people in their businesses, not their books at that time, but their businesses. And yet, even as coaches, we have blocks as well. And I think that's important to point out to any coaches that happen to be listening to this as well, is just that little reminder of opening ourselves to mentorship as well. Absolutely. We all need our mentors at all the way up and, and never ending because that's the never uh, ending. life life learning, correct? Yeah, we just keep going yes. on. And, and so that this kind of, uh, you've answered some of this question because I've got here what holds women back, but what, what have you come across as some of the biggest fears and obstacles that women need to overcome to step into their authorship power? So I know there's, there's yeah. but, but there's got to be some core ones that we all struggle with. Absolutely, there is. And the interesting part is these fears and limitations dress themselves up in fancy clothes. And we, we share them like legitimate reasons when really they're excuses in disguise. So we talk about it in terms of like, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I don't have the money, you know, all of, I'm not good enough, I don't have the training, um, I'm not a professional writer, all of these things, when in fact, if you pull back the layers of that onion, peel the layers, you notice that the commonality is a fear of judgment. It's imposter syndrome. It's, you know, the experiences that we've had in our life telling us that, you know, we're an expert in this one area, but books, like I'm a beginner at that. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable being a beginner again. There's this fear. It, it, it really all stems down to judgment. And mm -hmm. what are other people going to think? And if I'm an expert, like, shouldn't I be showing up in a certain way? When in fact, being an expert, like one of my favorite quotes, and I talk about this as my personal philosophy is a Mother Teresa quote. And she said, in some words similar to this, I can do things that you cannot. You can do things that I cannot together we can do great things. And I think that's the piece is those fears exist for all of us. And there's a way to move through that. Yes, absolutely. You're so right. It really is judgment. And I was just on a call the other day with a group of women and she is a coach in her own right, a very successful coach, but she does mm -hmm. art on the side. And, and I asked her, um, I said, well, is what kind of art is it? Because uh, there's all kinds of art. I mean, you could take photography as art. And she said, well, it's painting. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. And she says, yes, but I don't share it with anybody because I, mm. I couldn't imagine it being judged. And yes. I was like, whoa, because I guess you get so attached or close to it. But you're absolutely right. I never thought of the judgment. And it is a big fear because I've been a script writer as well. And at the beginning, I was very... Um, fearful of having anybody read it. I thought, oh, they're mm -hmm. going to think this is ridiculous, you know, but I got over that eventually, but it did take some, a shift in my mindset. Absolutely. So that being said, then, um, I know that mindset is a very uh, core essence to overcoming some of these fears and especially, like you said, judgment. What tips can you share with us that will help us inspire us to get started and also walk into that and leave our imposter behind? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if we ever leave the imposter behind. It's about how we choose to view that, um, how that informs our decision rather than letting it make our decisions for us. Just noticing like, oh, okay, this maybe this is showing up again. I must be on my growth edge. It's more of an indicator of, oh, I'm doing something big and new and exciting. I'm doing something worthwhile because if I stay small and only do the things that I already know that I'm exceptional at, imposter isn't going to show up a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It's when we're pushing that growth edge when it shows up. And so I talk about that a lot is this process is like a, a spiral staircase. I think personal growth, personal development really is like 
that spiral staircase because you're feeling really great. And then you start to go around the corner and elevate. And it's a little bit dark in that corner and something shows up. It's those voices. It's the stories we tell ourselves. And we have a choice in that moment, either to go back down to safety of that step that we were at, or we can just kind of get curious and push on and move up to the next level. And at each level, we're taking all of the learning, everything that we, all the tools that we've gathered, we're taking them with us. So we're never starting back at the beginning. I think that's a big piece to remember. Yes, you're a beginner at this thing, but you're not a beginner at life, right? It's really right. important, I think, with books or anything new that we're doing. Yes, absolutely. And of course, when we understand the science in that, because I'm, I'm a big neuroscience nerd, I guess, um, <laughs> you know, the, the mind, we, our, our, our humanness wants to keep us safe. I mean, that's really what yes. it's doing. But in keeping us safe, it keeps us small, like you said. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is expand that horizon. But you're right. That's why people say they, they like being in their comfort zone. Because mm -hmm. when you start to step into that, like you call it the dark, you know, the, the dark edge of the spiral staircase, that's where your mind is like, okay, we haven't done this before. I think it's a little scary. It's not good for you, you know, because something bad can happen. And that's what our, one of our voices is saying. So yes, yes. it's so important to have a coach like yourself and someone who guides individuals through this process because number one you need to know it's not unusual to feel that mm. but number two know that you have within you the power to overcome that and it's not a bad thing it's a good thing yeah so i love Absol i love that absolutely that metaphor with the spiral staircase because it really is a spiral so that being said, uh, let's delve into how do you lead authors through the story development process? Because this could be something that would really scare a lot of people. <laughs> it can be scary. Um, any, anything new is scary. And one thing that I wanted to add into that around mindset before we dig into this strategy piece is, also to think about, you know, we always find what we're looking for. And so if we're looking for evidence about why we're not good enough, that's what we're going to find. But if we're looking for, we have a lot of evidence in our life where we've done hard things, where we've done things as the beginner and had wild success. We have that evidence as well. So kind of putting your mind, your subconscious mind to work for you is like, find me these examples. Where do they exist? That evidence does exist for all of us in different ways, sh shapes and form. Right. And so when it comes to moving into strategy, it is also about micro goals and breaking it down. I think one of the most overwhelming things is to think about a book as a whole. Like, holy heck, that is <laughs> like 25, 45,000 words. And oh my God, how am I going to share this? But when you break things down into micro goals, that's where you start to experience some success and start to feel some level of comfort of knowing, okay, I'm going to take this bit by bit. And one of the ways that we do that is really coming up with what I call a killer outline. And my killer outline is not traditional in the sense of what you may have learned in an academic setting. <laughs> it's more about thinking about your audience, number one. Who, who is the primary person that this book is meant to serve? Who is it that you want? To, and, and our books can serve lots of people, right? And just like I, as a coach, I can serve lots of people. I choose to focus on women who are coaches and entrepreneurs, but I serve other people and your books will do the same thing. But if you're thinking about that primary audience person, like who is that one person? If I'm writing this book for Jane, what would I, what would she need to know? What is her problem? What is she trying to solve? And what would she need to know to get there um, to find that solution? And so we start with the end in mind and then we reverse engineer and break it down chapter by chapter, kind of what are the steps? And I work pretty exclusively with self-help and personal development. Now, this isn't going to work for fiction writing. There's a whole different strategy for fiction writing or for memoir. But this is for self-help and personal development is kind of going through that step process. What would each, and those steps can become chapters. 
And then what's going to be in each chapter? What's important to know? What would be the stories that I'm going to share? What would be the um, data, the supporting data mm -hmm. that's important to share? And breaking that down for each point so that when you go to sit down and write, you're never looking at a blank page. This outline is going to guide you each writing session. You go into that and you know what you're writing about today. So it, it right. cuts down that overwhelm and certainly um, <laughs> a whole lot of the writer's block that can show up when you when you just go into it. You hear a lot and I talk about it. <laughs> you might have seen my Instagram uh, post about this, but like some of the worst advice that I hear is just like, just start writing. Like, no, mm. please, no. If you want to journal and it's for the purpose of journaling or it's cathartic in that way, fantastic. But if you want to write a book, no, have a plan well before you start writing. Mm. That is the golden nugget right there. Have a plan <laughs> because you are right, Lynette. There are so many people out there that just say, just write. You know, it doesn't matter if it makes it in your book. The practice is what it, it takes, you know, and keep writing and writing and writing. And you're like, well, OK, but this isn't any good. This isn't doing me any good because especially because you said your focus is on books that are for uh, self-development, um, for co like the authors or coaches trying to, uh, you know, uh, have their clients or their readers learn something. So you, you just don't want to write about anything and it provides us with a blueprint. So I love that because if there's a blueprint, then we have something to, to aim for. And like you said, you're never at a day where you're sitting at a blank page and you say, now what am I going to write about? No, because you've helped the individual craft their blueprint, basically. And you take it from there. Yes. I, I, yeah, I love that. That's really helpful. And one Good, good. A couple other things I'd throw in there and thinking about the blueprint concept. I think the other thing that's really important to think about is just like every home has its own blueprint. Every book does too. So it's not one size fits all, right? right. And even though it's self-help or personal development, each author that I work with, their blueprint, their killer outline is a little bit different the way that we approach it. And so it isn't one size fits all. One tool that we use often is about, and actually I have all of my clients do this before we start working together, is creating a story bank. And that's a place where you're not writing out fully fleshed stories or writing, but it is about capturing ideas from lived experiences that you could tell a story about. Because what we know is story is what creates connection. And so having a book full of data or instruction isn't gonna make a personal connection with someone. It's your stories. And in creating that story bank, you know, maybe out of a hundred story ideas, three of them end up in your book. However, you have all of this rich material that you can use in social media posts, that you can use in newsletters or blogs or interviews or your next book. So creating that story bank is also another idea as far as a strategy for getting your book created. Right, right. And I love that, that name that you've given it, Story Bank. It's, and it's it, not mine. I can't take credit for it. But, oh. but that is, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. a, you know, a place you're depositing all of these ideas. And it's also like, uh, just like we look for evidence, we find it. Well, when you start thinking about your life and your experiences as stories that you can use as teaching tools, or to demonstrate a point, like every day you have something that you can add to that story bank. Just, right. it doesn't have to be big and audacious. It can be this kind of seemingly humdrum situation going to the grocery store and something happens at the grocery store that is a perfect demonstration of a, a more complicated point that you want to be able to share with your reader. You're right. Because when your your antenna is up, so to speak, and you, you yes. planted this seed working with you, say, um, and your antenna's up, then you, you know, let's say something happens at the grocery store. Normally you would just come home and maybe tell your spouse or someone, and then you'd forget about it. But then you could say, wow, this would be a good story for my book or something that I could put in my bank to, to reference later. Yep. So I love that because you've got people living on a plane of awareness now 
for the purpose of writing their book or putting it uh, for, like you said, your blog, your, your, your social media, et cetera, et cetera. I love that. That's brilliant. Oh my God. Put the, put your stories as deposits <laughs> in your bank. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's wonderful. So that being Good. said, we're putting these incredible n n um, chunks of information into our bank. So what are the keys then to turning our wisdom into impact? Share some of the strategies because this is something that I am so excited about sharing because there is a uh, strategy to making your book a best-selling one. There is, there is, and there's lots of tactics and techniques that I could share and talk about metadata and categories and all kinds of stuff that would just make you go like blurry eyed, but at its core, whether it's a bestseller, whether it's your impact, where you're going to have that is when you're writing a book, when you're taking your wisdom, the things that you're passionate about, something that you love to talk about right? That's where your best-selling idea comes from. Because if you're excited to talk about it, you're going to be excited to write about it. And then you're going to be excited to tell people about your book. One of the things that I see too often, it just breaks my heart, is people write these great books. And then they think that just by putting it up on Amazon, it's going to fly off the shelves. And in truth, it's it will sell very little if you're not talking about it. It's about creating the buzz. And with bestsellers, I think one of the things it's incredible number one i want to acknowledge it's incredible to become a best-selling author to have a book that has that title that is a bestseller and also what i want to shine a spotlight on is best-selling is much more to do with marketing than it is about the content of your book other than what i just shared right if it's something that you're passionate and want to talk about that you know you have an idea that can change lives, that can transform lives, that can transform communities in our world, you get juiced up about that and you wanna talk about it. And so it's easier to um, start that, what I call the credibility continuum. It's about starting to, you're talking about it, then somebody else is talking about it, you get some PR, you get some, uh, you're in the paper, you're on the news, you're on a great podcast, and then people start, you know, there's more opportunities that come from that. It starts this whole credibility continuum. So as far as choosing that idea, that's that's where it all starts. And that's where your bestseller comes from. You can we can build a strategy and we can do all those tactical things. But if that one thing is missing, forget about it, because even if you happen to get bestseller status, what does that gain you? If it's not something that you are truly excited and passionate about, it's it's really an empty title that loses its appeal shortly thereafter that you've achieved it. That's right. the sad truth. Yes, and especially in the genre that we're talking about, which yes. is self-help, self-improvement, um, all of that, that I could see that definitely it has to be a passion or like you said, I mean, we could put out books on statistics all day long. Are they, are they going to be a bestseller? Right. I highly doubt it. But even if one became a bestseller, it's like, okay, well, now I have my reference book. <laughs> no big deal. You but know, yeah, we'll check mark. Exactly. A check mark. Yes. But I, I find that it, what I got a takeaway from that was best selling boils down to a lot of it is marketing. And the way to get people excited about the marketing is is your energy, your passion, you know, putting it out there. And it yeah. Yeah, it really is. And if you think about it, I don't know if this has happened to you or, or any of um, your listeners, but I have in the past picked up a book that has the title even of New York Times bestselling, mm -hmm. you know, bestseller, mm -hmm. New York Times, instant bestseller. And you read the book and you think, that mm -hmm. wasn't that great. Has that ever happened yeah. to you? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And so that's the piece about, you know, the marketing behind it. Yes, it's selling books is what creates an actual bestseller. Book awards are about the quality of the book. So it's two separate mm -hmm. things. Right. While I also want to create the distinction of I highly, <laughs> I can't even say this strongly enough, highly advocate. I work with all of my clients to create that quality level book that 
earns like the quality levels up to what people think a bestseller means, right? Because most people don't understand really what bestseller means. Right. Yes, absolutely. I could see that. And, and this being said, so you've got your, you've got your outline, you've got your story bank now with the genre that we're in, explain mm -hmm. how a book, this is what really resonated with me when I spoke with Lynette earlier. This is where all you coaches need to step up and listen, <laughs> explain how a book becomes a powerful business building tool to support your mission, boost your influence, impact, brand, authority, and revenue because this oh. is what we all want. Oh my gosh, yes, right? And that is, so I come to everything with that. I have the business strategy background. So when I come, when I'm looking at the book, that really is a big lens that I'm using is what is our strategy? What is your goal for the book? And I wanna acknowledge that everyone has a different motivation for wanting to become a published author for wanting to become a best-selling published author. And so it's important to look at what is that goal, what's driving you. But if elevating your impact and your influence and your bottom line, if all those things are important, along with creating this incredible impact in the world, then it's important that, it's important, number one, going back to you're talking about your book. It is about becoming visible the more you show up, whether it's on Instagram, I'll use myself for example, I, I was a little slow to really wanting to show up on video and reels. And I had this perception that it meant that I had to be dancing and I'm not a dancer. Um, but when I show, started showing up, right, and creating my author platform, and also in my case, my business platform, showing up in that way, then opportunities started showing up. It's just like we talked about a little bit earlier with this credibility continuum. Once someone sees you on someone's podcast or their show and it's like, oh, I really like their perspective. Here's an opportunity. Maybe would you like to come speak to my group? Maybe it's an in-person speaking engagement. That's a big one I would say for authors that I see is an incredible increase. If, so if your goals are around increasing your speaking, paid speaking especially, um, then a book is a great tool. Some places, some of the bigger platforms, it doesn't matter how great of a speaker you are, if you don't have a book, they're not going to invite you to their stage. I heard a story about this from one of the social media, actually, social media um, large events. There was an individual who had a longstanding relationship and really loved, um, you know, everything that they stood for, but that person didn't yet have a book. And that was a prerequisite for all of their speakers that they had a book. So if you want to get on more stages, someone's going to hear you, invite you onto the stage. When you're on the stage, who are you meeting? You're meeting other event planners, possibly people that future coaching clients, um, somebody from the media. Okay. And then you get this media opportunity and then more people learn about you. It's compounding effect. I think that's the big takeaway is you can have a book and do nothing with it. That's, that's something you can choose. For some people, it is just enough to publish the book. And I honor that because everyone has their own journey. If, however, your motivation is just like I said, to build, to elevate your credibility, your influence, your brand, your bottom line, your impact, all of those things, it's about showing up. And when you show up and then you have your book to support this, you're the expert, right? You wrote a book about this topic. There's something that happens innately, just immediately. You're no smarter, you're no more experienced. Well, you have gone through quite a personal growth journey if you've written a book in full yeah. disclosure, but you're still the same person as you were before you wrote the book. But in the eyes of society, uh, you have, because you're one of probably 3%, one to 3% of people that say they wanna write a book actually do. Right. Right. So that gives you a lot of instant credibility. And there's not a lot of places we get that kind of instant credibility as we do with a book. So it's about being visible and then riding that wave of momentum. 
And when you start to catch the momentum that you don't stop, I think that's another place where I see people make a, a misstep sometimes is it's like, oh, you know, I've got this big influx. I was on this uh, top 100 podcast and I had a big influx of business and then they just kind of get back into the business instead of thinking about working on the business and how the right. book will serve them and they shy away from it. So it can be like a feast and famine cycle. And so I really encourage people, and I'm a little off track there, but um, just in thinking about how you use that to leverage it is it's always, it should be always top of mind, always for you and for the people that you're interacting with. Right, yes. And it, it, to me, it becomes your calling card as well. So, you know, you, you, you've, you've got, say you're prospecting someone and you want to be on that conference stage um, you send them your book. It maybe it's not necessary yeah. that you are an author, but you if you do have your book, well, let me send you my book um, because I feel that you know I would resonate with your audience, and then that becomes your calling card as well. Um, yes, I love it. That's the influence and the impact that you can have. And what I love too, Lynette, is the impact that you can have with a book. You know, you can't oh, maybe yes. always touch base with people, but people will find you maybe through a book because I'm a great book reader and I'm sure you are too. Uh, yes. <laughs> but you know, and there's people that I never would have known of except that I've read their book. So yeah, it's well, a, go ahead. a quick story just recently that happened with the light beamers book series. They're um, an anthology. So it's a collection of stories. And I just got reports on those from there's a delay in the reporting and your sales, but I just got a March. Uh, reporting and saw that the book sold 21 copies in Australia. This is a group of women in the United States that are authors in this book, 10 authors from the United States, and yet 21 books. And 21 maybe sounds like a little thing. And when it comes to royalties, it's not going to be a lot for 21 books. But when you shift the lens and you think about impact, and now these women have their stories, that's going to start thinking because we have a book, we recommend it when it's a good book. We give it to our friends. We give it as gifts. I think about the most transformational book in my own journey was Jack Canfield's book, The Success Principles. And I have gifted that book. I can't tell you how many times, right? Because that's what we do. We love to tell people about things that work, that are transformational. Or, you know, just great. If we find a great pair of shoes that we like, we talk about it. Books are no oh, yeah. different. We Books are no different. Women are great at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my husband's like you women boy i tell you you encourage each other to buy things i said well someone has to keep the economy going <laughs> but, but you're right you're absolutely right and that kind of gave me chills because we are making an impact and and the way that we can expand that is through book writing and one thing i just wanted to put in here it doesn't have to be a huge volume book it could be you know something as small as a pocket Amen. book you know, and, and yes. even that, those are fabulous and influential. So that being said, let's move on to this question, because this goes back to the point that you made about judgment. Well, Lynette, this question goes back to what you were saying about judgment. And I'm sure there's mm -hmm. many people that you may have dealt with in the past talking of the pros and cons of feedback. So why is that important? And what advice can you share when clients are resistant to feedback? Yeah, feedback can be tough, right? Because we are tender, it's vulnerable, we've done this work. And one of the things that we do in the process um, is we have alpha readers, someone that's actually reading through your manuscript before it even goes to the editor. And the reason for that is to get feedback about is there are there any ideas that maybe are disconnected um, that you can address before you even go to the editor? And so what's important is setting our minds in motion for receiving that feedback and reframing what feedback is, because it is a gift. When we're asking for feedback, it's the intention. When we're choosing people, and this is a big thing, we are choosing the people that we work with and we are choosing the people that we invite to be our alpha readers. When we're choosing those people, it's because we respect them. 
and we value their opinion. It isn't just some random person on the internet. We've built a relationship mm -hmm. already. And so in taking that feedback, knowing that they have your highest good in, you know, all of this is coming forward to help you shine, to make you better. At the same token with feedback is that just because one person tells you something does not make it true. So when you think about in writing, if we, um, with alpha readers, I say invite five people, think about people, and we talk about different categories of people to choose. But in these five people, if one person says something and their feedback doesn't resonate with you, it doesn't feel right, like to your intention of what you're trying to write, if it's only one person, then I would say, okay, we'll always thank you for your feedback. Thank you for taking the time to share that with me. But it isn't necessarily something I'm going to take on board. Right. But if you end up that you have three people that said in this same paragraph, you kind of lost me here. I wasn't sure. Or I'd like you to say more about this. You left me hanging. Okay. If three people told me, then I probably need to take a look at this, even if I'm thinking it's crystal clear. We're always going to think we're clear because it's our idea, <laughs> right? right? It's our knowledge. And, and sometimes we forget to put context around that idea. And so the feedback can help us to see those things. But one of the things that I do with clients when we get to the editing stage and working with the editor is really doing some significant mind work around mindset work around how we're going to approach that. Because we are, it's kind of like old programming, right? When you think about going, when you were in elementary school or going up through school and you saw that red X on your yeah. paper, right? It just automatically, if you see red, it makes you think, oh, judgment, you're bad. You did something wrong. You're not good enough. And it feeds into all those old negative stories. Whereas if we can see, if we can retrain our brain to see that when it's coming from the editor every place that there's a red mark or there's a comment, it's an opportunity for your work to shine even more greatly. Mm -hmm. There, there is your partner to help you turn that into sparkle and shine, right? To put that, no one can share your intellectual property, your lived experiences. You're the only one that can do that. And until it gets on the page, it's not going anywhere. But no matter how rough it is once you get it on the page, sharing it with those alpha readers, sharing it with the editor and getting the feedback, they can help you refine it, but you're, mm -hmm. it has to start with you putting something on the page. So yes, you do have to open yourself up to feedback and knowing that, like I said, not everything is just because someone says it doesn't mean that it's true. It's their opinion. It's subjective, but also looking at, does it change does it change the meaning? One of the things the clients that we're working with right now on the third light beamers book, as we're going into the edit review, what I'm saying is approach it thinking about maybe that isn't the exact word that you would use, but does it change your overall meaning? Because the editor typically ha is grounded right in the industry in a different way. And so if there's a different phrasing to make it grammatically correct or to make it flow, to make your idea more clearly, as long as it's not changing the overall, it's like, okay, great. She just gave me a nugget that's going to make me better. I don't need to wrestle that. I don't need to fight with that. I'm just going to, okay, great, good. That makes my idea clearer for the audience. It's always about the reader. So part of this process of taking feedback on board is also having a healthy conversation with our ego to let us know that no one is trying to hurt us. Everyone is trying to help us with this. And feedback from anonymous sources, that's a whole other conversation, but kind of in this, in this realm of people nurturing you, working with you, helping you to get your work, usher your work out into the world so it can make the impact that it's meant to make, that's really about getting your mind wrapped around, you know, it isn't punitive. It isn't someone trying to tamp you down. They're actually trying to lift you up. Oh, I love that. Yes, that is the key. And I, I love the fact that you, you walk them through their mindset because you're, it's perspective, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, they're here to make you shine. They're not yes. imposing uh, rules and regulations because it's their way or the highway. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> that is, 
that is a, a, a great way to approach feedback because I, I do uh, empathize with, I'm, I'm not one that takes um, feedback poorly. I'm, I'm always like, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, I want your opinion. <laughs> Tell me what you really right. think. But I understand because I have met people who get offended when you try to correct them. And it's not because you, you're, you're trying to lift them up. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to offend them, but yeah, it's mindset. Definitely. And, yeah. and even, and I would say I've worked, uh, so my former life, I was a human resource professional and it, it always depends. It's situational. I find with how people receive feedback, if it's something that you feel really confident in, you receive the feedback differently than if it's something that you feel vulnerable or you're already feeling a little wobbly about. So I think that's the other thing. Um, sometimes we have authors that go into it. This is like, oh, bring it on. Like the yeah. more feedback, the better. And then they they sometimes are inadvertently inviting people to be abrupt and curt with their feedback instead mm -hmm. of being thoughtful with their feedback. And right. really that's what it's about. It's about being thoughtful. And yes, it's still, it's vulnerable. No matter how tough you are, no matter how much you invite and love feedback, it's different when it's your, especially your first book, the yeah. first time you go through that process, it's, it's really tender. Yeah. Well, that's why the authors need you <laughs> to help <laughs> hold their hands and tell them it's going to be fine. <laughs> we're, we're making a, a, a masterpiece is what we're doing. Yes. <laughs> it takes some yeah. time. But well, that being said, now moving on to another avenue of book writing, promoting your book. Mm -hmm. Give us, mm -hmm. I, and you spoke a little bit of, about, you know, getting excited about it and social media and all that, but give us some insight because this is a whole business on its own of book promotion. Who is involved? When do you start? And the difference in it makes when you have a plan. Yeah, it is just like writing. You you must have a plan. And the number one thing on that plan is you start promoting your book the day you decide to write a book. And that is often something that gets missed, right? We think about, oh, it's not until I'm actually ready to publish that I'm going to start talking about the book. No. You start marketing and you may not think of it as marketing, but it, you're going to pull back the curtain and let people in on your process because like, over 80% of people want to write a book. Like I said earlier, only one to 3% will. So people are going to live vicariously through you, number one, and they're going to be involved and invested. They want to see what's happening in your process. So when you invite them in, you are whetting their appetite to want to learn more about your book. So you start early and you talk about your book from beginning to end. And how you do that is sharing the process that you go through. And I encourage my authors to share, you know, the ups and downs. They're it's not all sunshine and roses. It is work. And there are times, like I said, that are tender. And to share that and just show up as yourself going through the process. People respect that and they're, they are going to want to be on board. Then when it comes time that it's publication, also, like I said, they have, they already can't wait to get their hands on the book. But probably about 12 weeks out, you're going to gather a launch team to help you get this book out into the world. And those people that have been following your journey, they are geared up and ready to help. They want to shout from the rooftop and tell people about this masterpiece that you have created. And so it helps a lot in creating your launch team, launch teams. And we could do a whole episode, <laughs> right, on book promotion and all of these things. But it's creating a community. We talk about building an author platform. It means having a following, having people that are interested and invested, not only in your topic, because anybody can write about your topic. Probably 100 people already have, but there's only one you. And so it's about having people invested in you and your book, right? And if you don't yeah. show up, then they, they can't, they don't know, like, and trust you. And that's the big thing. Why we show up and want to be visible is people don't know you until you show them. You need to show up. Exactly. Yes. And thank you for sharing that because I, I read that on your site and I found that fascinating that the minute you decide to step into your authorship, you start promoting. It's not, yep. oh, now I've got my book um, because I noticed that there's so many now that do pre-sales. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's before their books even printed. So it, it, uh, that was a light bulb for me because I've always thought, well, I have to have it written and in print and ready to go before I mention it. But that's mm -hmm. not the way it works today. It's definitely nope. not. And it makes no. a big difference, but fascinating. And yes, maybe one day we will put that on about a whole <laughs> series on book promotion because it is an entire business on its own for sure. It is. So it is. speaking of getting it printed, this is mm -hmm. something that I was very curious about. What determines how many books you would order with your first printing? And is there a minimum that you must print? Mm. Well, that's a great question. And one of the beautiful things about the industry these days um, and self-publishing and people professionally self-publishing is you don't have to. In fact, my authors don't. They use print on demand technology. So they work with companies that distribute to bookstores and libraries and colleges and all of those things, but they print the books on demand. And the benefit of that is you don't have that number one upfront investment, uh, right? To buy 2000 books. And then where the heck are you going to store the books? And you're probably going to have to spend more money to rent someplace to store them. And then you have to distribute them. You become the distributor when you are purchasing books. Print on demand eliminates that. And so as someone orders your book, it's printed that day. And then it's shipped out by whoever your distributor is. So whether it's Kindle Direct Publishing or Ingram Spark, or there are a number of them, but um, that's what I recommend. And usually with offset offset printing, which is kind of that more traditional what um, what it was in years past before this print on demand technology came into play is like it's at least 500 books. And for many, it is a thousand or 2000. It depends on the distributor or the printer, excuse me. And something that um, some of the folks in my inner circle, as far as in the author and publishing world that they ran into is they were doing their printing in China. And when mm. the um, pandemic came about, their books were sitting in containers that couldn't get into port or were sitting, you know, that they just couldn't be released. So there's a lot of factors that come into that as well and cost and whether you mm. do that um, internationally or you do it in the United States. But with print on demand, it eliminates all of that. There's some wow. restrictions, you know, there's a few, there's less options as far as sizes or special features. Like if you want some kind of um, foiling imprint or raised lettering on your cover, that's hard to do. You can't do that on print on demand. But for most people, um, they're going to be able to get a really great result with print on demand. So print on demand then, that's fabulous. And thank you for sharing that. That saves a lot of, of, of cost. Um, and yes. and time because you said like you said if you have them you have become the distributor as well which becomes a whole nother thing that you have to take care of um mm -hmm. what's so you're actually pushing or your platforms um like we said before your marketing is pushing the sale of the book so it's actually they then order it correct because that's what the print on demand is they they send in their order for a book well, and you're able to go to like Barnes and Noble or bookshop.org or Amazon and you order your book, they print it and fulfill that order. Oh, okay. And so you're not involved in that piece at all. Right. It's having yeah. your book available on those platforms where it can be printed. Okay. Yeah. That, that was one of my questions too, because they, they can make it available at Barnes and Noble or any of those other places. They just have to order it for the client. Yeah, the customer. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so you you end up in a catalog essentially that the booksellers yeah. are ordering from. Now, if you print only on Amazon, then Barnes and Noble isn't going to carry your book. You do have to make decisions when you're choosing who um, who you want to be as your distributor and what your goals are there as well. But um, there's lots of options. Mm, okay, I, I hear that sounds like another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but this it's is wonderful. Very... Because yeah, go ahead. I was going to say there, there's such intricacies to yeah. um, the world of publishing today and so much opportunity, but it always goes back to, I can't tell you how often I say, let's go back to the goal. 
let's go back to what, why you wanted to publish the book. What is it you want the book to do? And for some people, it isn't even about the actual sales of the book. They don't really care about book royalties. They care about having the book that they can use to give that promoter, to get on the stage, to give to clients, potential clients. So how you approach that it's going to be different. The decisions you make are always going to be driven by what is your personal goal going into this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. To make that impact and have make a difference in the world, going back to one of your passions and is mentoring <laughs> yes. women to do that. So yes, absolutely. And uh, funny enough, when you said going back to the goal of why I thought, I thought you said going back to the gold and oh, I thought, yes. yes, it is going back to the gold, right? Your why is your gold. I mean, that was just a, it just popped into my head because I thought, oh, that's brilliant. I love it. Yes, the gold <laughs> is your book. Oh, wow. Well, so I just had to share that. So <laughs> let us share with our audience the additional services that you provide to help make a book a success story. Like I know, and you can just, we've talked about most of these, but you know, I've just listed some professional editing, book formatting, cover design, but just, we don't have to go into them in detail, but just to give our audience an idea of how much knowledge you carry as being this uh, a book mentor coach, because you have so much expertise. So if you could share that, that would be great. Yeah. So part of my process when I work with mentoring clients is more to educate them about the process, how to interview, how to find, where are you going to find an editor? I introduce them to editors. They, um, you know, uh, I educate them about the process and then they're actually making those hiring decisions. So I'm empowering them with the knowledge to go make a good decision and I support them through the process. So I don't have a team. My team doesn't consist of, I'm a done with you kind of person. I'm not a done for you. So I'm not publishing um, very few books, very few under Positivity Lady Press. Mostly it's done with you. So I'm holding your hand, guiding you, taking you through every step. You know, what, how, how, what to expect when for pricing, for instance, and with editing, some people price by the word, some people by the page, some by the project. How do you find out? Do you get samples? How do you work with people? What does that look like? So where my experience comes in, and it really is mentorship, is being able to share that to educate them so they're not going into it blindly, that they feel like they're well equipped to go in and make a good decision. And that can be really hard when you don't have any frame of reference and it's a brand new industry to you, a brand new process. And sometimes, unfortunately, what happens is people skimp on those professional pieces and it takes away from the value. It diminishes the value that they're bringing. Um, let it let your work shine to its full mm-hmm. potential. Your intellectual property is one thing, and then put it in beautiful packaging. Let it show yeah. up as its very best form. And working with professionals is what helps you do that. Right, and that would be professional cover designers as well. Yes, um, it just cover designers layout. Yeah. yeah, right proofreading, like having a final proofread, your editor generally is not going to be your final proofreader because once you have your work laid out in book form, you want somebody to go back through. Sometimes it can be wonky stuff that happens with formatting on the back end. Um, You want somebody to go in and just make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed per se. Yeah. It's it's a team of industry. Yeah. It's, yeah. It definitely takes a village. You know, I received a book just recently from uh, someone who had written their own book, a coach. And I think they may have skimped because for me, it didn't feel very professional. Like even the printing inside was kind of big and clunky, which was odd um, because usually, you know, the print is good. But right. I know I know what you mean. That's the first book I've ever received that I had that feeling. Most of the others are very professional. I mean, I really never even noticed. It's just that this caught my attention. So it does make a difference. And like you said, it's all about making you shine. I mean, like you said, whether you want the book to just share with your close friends and family, or of course, if you want it for promotion and revenue generating, you want it to be professionally. Because like I said, it is your calling card. And that says everything about you know, who you are and where you're coming from and so on and so forth. So this is your company name is She Gets Published, 
correct? She gets published. Yes. She gets published. That's the brand. And so yep. that's the brand. And so tell our audience where they can get in touch with you. So I the mean, easiest place is, yeah, you can find me. I'm very active on Instagram, which the handle is at she gets published. And then my website is she gets published.com. I do have a podcast as well, which is rich with information. If you're interested in this whole conversation, going deeper into thinking about the things, all things writing and publishing, and it's she gets published podcast.com to find that. Okay, wonderful. And if there was one critical message you could share with the world, what would that be? That's such a loaded question, right? There, and there's so many things. And I, I think for me, at its core, it's just the message of you are capable of so much more than you give your credit self credit for. And I think that's a universal message. I think we sometimes put limits on ourselves and what we're capable of doing. And when we unleash our full potential, the impact that that makes in the world. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you. That was beautiful. And because we're here on the Epic Vision Zone, I have one last question for you. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? And you know, this was not an easy one for me. You think the book person, this would be easy, but no, because there's so much research that goes into getting the right title. But from, from the core perspective of what has my life been like, I think the things that came up for me is like messy growth. There's no straight lines. Mm. These are the things that are true for me. Um, or maybe it would be something like, you've got this. You know, that's the message mm. to myself to my younger self, to my future self, you know, I'm still in an evolution where it's always when you think about up leveling, those limits come back. It's that spiral staircase. So you've got this. Let's use that for a title. Yeah, I like that. That's that's inspiring. You've got this. And then your subtitle could be messy <laughs> is is marvelous. <laughs> messy <laughs> makes this marvelous, right? There you go. I love it. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Lynette. This is packed with so much valuable information. I wanted to thank you again for your time and joining us here. And for information to connect with Lynette, once again, go to her Instagram at she gets published and her website as well. She gets published.com as well as her podcast. And you will find all that information on the Epic Vision Zone bio pages. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Jane Applegath. And don't forget to connect with me at janeapplegath.com where you can access your free download, The Keys to Your Dreams. I'm sending you so much love and success. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success.